welcome to Barn Vlog. And today I'm here with Freddie DeBoer, and we are talking about his new book, um, How Elites Ate the Social Justice Movement. Yes, How Elites Ate the Social Justice Movement. Thank you, because I'm like, the title's actually long. Um, the, uh, the working title was uh, uh, No Justice, No Peace, No Progress, but um, Simon and Schuster didn't like it, so... So they they came up with a new one, which is a sentence. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so what's interesting is I guess there is a, you're you're actually the second book on this topic uh, in some ways because there's a lead capture by uh, Taiwo mm -hmm. uh, Olofemi Taiwo. Olofemi Taiwo, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but that book is, has a kind of more limited scope than yours when I was reading yours. So why do you, I mean, elites being attracted to social justice movement is actually nothing new. And I think it's been kind of observed, uh, since, uh, probably the mid seventies, this was a trend, but it does seem like this this last round was recuperated more quickly than normal. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think attracts fairly elite people to social justice movements? Sure. So um, one of the things that I don't say in the book um, and have not said uh, in my long history of uh, making this kind of complaint is um, this is not a problem of a lack of sincerity, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, I think the kind of people that I'm describing, which, you know, the book sort of spells out very specifically in, in different domains, the kind of people I'm talking about. But in general, I would say that it's like um, the sort of, ed, ed, you know, hyper-educated managerial class of the United States that has um, <clears throat> gone through the meritocratic apparatus and has emerged with credentials, like in terms of actual diplomas, but also is enculturated to a certain set of sort of like cultural attitudes and linguistic uh, signifiers, et cetera, that sort of signal them as a person who comes from this strata. Uh, they tend to be overwhelmingly urbanites, people who live in major city centers, um, and they tend to be found in jobs that sort of uh, <clears throat> are in this sort of um, sort of like discursive slash managerial slash administrative sort of position. Um, I think that those people in general actually do care a great deal about fighting racism or uh, reaching gender equality or advancing the, the interests of LGBTQ people. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the most sort of like uh, uh, sympathetic part of this is just, I do think that they are, authentically motivated by a desire to sort of contribute to these causes. The problem is that um, that same process of getting absorbed into the meritocratic machine creates a kind of path dependency where they become unable to see any means through which change can occur. That is not itself an expression of um, this great American sort of sorting system of like, uh, <clears throat> that is, again, uh, proceduralist, that uh, views success in terms of getting individuals into sort of enviable positions um, within society, uh, that <clears throat> is very heavily slanted towards issues that are linguistic and symbolic, etc. I think that they've been, they've come through that apparatus, and it trains them to see all social problems in that, in that sort of domain. Whereas it's just really hard to be the kind of, and they're mostly all white, but they're not, they're not all white, but mostly all white, um, to be kind of like, you know, well-meaning white kid from a affluent suburb in Maryland who uh, goes to Duke and then um, <clears throat> gets their law degree and ends up working for a nonprofit in Manhattan that is vaguely sort of aligned with social justice. It's hard for that person to just sort of say, you know, unions are what we need to do, right? Like we need to return to the labor movement. So I think there's a there's a a, a sort of a, a, a sort of sympathetic side of which they actually care about these issues, 
But there's also a sense in which the way that we mint this kind of person in this country, the way that we churn out our little meritocrats, um, creates a path dependency where they can't see any other venues than the ones that sort of brought them to where they are, if that makes sense. When I was reading your book, I was reminded of uh, Michael Sandel's work on meritocracy, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, it does make a lot of sense to me that there is a bias in a kind of semi-downwardly mobile, actually, uh, educated elite, um, uh, a... I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you feel about Peter Turchin's work, nor do I accept all of his arguments. But I do think there is some truth to us, us as a society, actually being pushed into a massive credentialization from both ends, both in the you know stable middle class and homes maintaining their status, but also in a lot of people like me who were basically told that if we didn't play that game early on, that we had no future too, because the kind of blue collar jobs that our parents had just weren't going to exist anymore and we were going to be like service sector people mm -hmm. and so you had that tension <clears throat> and what i think is interesting and your book doesn't talk about it super a lot but i wanted to ask you why you think this is uh the left broadly conceived and i'm not going to play the games about who's on it right now because that's tiresome mm. um doesn't really have a whole lot of the upwardly mobile former working class people. I mean, they exist. It's not unheard of, but it's we do not seem to be in general the people who are attracted to this iteration of either the progressive or honestly the far left unless it comes through labor unions. Mm -hmm. And and I've always wondered about that because we theoretically we in, we intermingled in the same institutions and have some of the same <laughs> values just because we got through these institutions right. um although i suspect our experience of these meritocratic institutions are very different but well, let's touch on church in real quick right mm -hmm. so i think i think the the difficulty with the elite overproduction th thesis is um mm -hmm. <clears throat> in 2023 right what is the elite status to which people are aspiring for which there are an insufficient number of slots right so when Kirchin describes a formal aristocratic aristocratic excuse me society you know a uh a a england right the the uh the actual formal like, like uh, hereditary aristocracy of england um when there was overproduction of elites within that class um there was literally like a certain number of titles that could be handed out and they were uh breeding more kids than there could be to have those titles and those titles carried with them actual yeah. land right like so they were the landed gentry and that was what was being handed down as well as sort of influence in government um i myself have written pieces where i sort of applied uh peter Churchin's uh <clears throat> sort of elite overproduction thesis to the moment right now but it's difficult to, to say precisely okay what is the thing that ambitious sort of young striving types are striving for that has a sort of zero sum nature to it. You know, I've said in the past that I look at like creative uh, occupations, right? So um, <clears throat> these people tend to be set up to have sort of enviable sort of socioeconomic class status in terms of being able to become lawyers or doctors or engineers or, um, you know, uh, bureaucrats of various kinds at colleges or nonprofits or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, that's not, sort of sexy and cool um and so that maybe what they're sort of striving for is recognition as sort of like an artist which is like you know one of the only ways in which we still sort of grant people the status of being like an enviable human being because we spent the past you know 60 plus years ironizing right the idea that professional success is in and of itself something that's enviable um uh, you know, sometimes it's conveniently sort of uh, lays itself out, like as in with the lawyer glut of the early 2010s, where 
uh, we were just training too many lawyers and there were insufficient number of sort of positions for them. <clears throat> and that was creating a class of people who had taken on a lot of student loan debt and done a lot of work and couldn't get those jobs. Um, producing, producing exactly the kind of resentment that Churchin describes. Um, but that was a, that's a very sort of self-contained thing and it corrected itself because enough people heard about that that they stopped applying to law school, right? Um, I do think that it's the case that you can't really have uh, <clears throat> the sort of 2010 experience, uh, uh, particularly like as sort of emblemized in Occupy, which is, you know, ultimately, as I say in the book, a very minor thing Occupy was, but it was a, a uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of prophetic about what was going to come in the rest of the decade. Um, you couldn't really have that without this period where a lot of people who had trained to be meritocratic elites emerged into the world of the post-financial crisis economy and found themselves uh, unable to get the jobs that they thought they wanted. Um, I remember the the journal, The New Inquiry, um, <clears throat> one of the biggest themes of their, their early issues when they first started coming out was... Um, People, uh, you know, had worked really hard and gone to NYU and were now not getting the internships that they thought that they deserved, right? Um, and you can be cynical about that, but it, you know, that sort of thing is necessary in order to sort of coalesce a sort of intellectual movement for, for progressive change. As far as the question of, you know, why are there not upward, why are there more sort of downwardly mobile, like educated elites who don't have... Uh, the actual, like, you know, enviable position in the economy. Why are there more of those in the left coalition than there are of, like, um, sort of striving, sort of lower to upper class sort of, you know, bootstrappers who are moving themselves up? I don't have a great answer for you. Um, there, are, there aren't a lot of these people in general. We just know due to the, the pretty, you know, extreme lack of in, uh, income mobility in the United States. Um, but... I would just surmise that if you have done that, if you have moved from low to high um, <clears throat> and you've done so sort of within the system as it's uh, as it's currently written, um, it's tempting to sort of just defend the system. Right. And to say, no, actually, merit meritocracy works. I'm I'm proof. I you know, I, I deserve my my current status. I worked hard for it. I came from nothing and you can, too. I think that I was probably inclined that way until about 2010 when I realized that having worked my way up, I still was only going to do as well as my parents. Mm -hmm. um, right. That, you know, the best I might do is own a small house that would cost me way more money, um, even relative, even relatively than my parents and that everything that they had acquired in the 70s and 80s was going to take me moving up almost two whole social classes to be right. able to do so it which was radicalizing for me but i i, I agree with you actually that uh, it, part of it's survivor's bias when you're working your way up it's like oh well you know of course i deserve this because i got here and i come from nothing right right um but it does seem <clears throat> to me to kind of be a, a sincere problem as a check against the kind of things that you're writing about in your book, because in some ways I do smell that bullshit on people immediately right. when, when and, and I like you, I don't think it's insincere. I don't think these people are just power grubbing or using NGOs as like a way to control society consciously or anything like that. I'm not, I, I, that's not what I mean, but there is a, there is a certain like, you know, my question is always uh, when people ask me that, like, can you take an unpaid internship and can you go home and live comfortably with your parents for more than two months? Because yeah. if if you can, then you and I are still not from the same background. Like, and that really does seem to affect the way they think about a lot of the social <laughs> issues. Like it really is kind of blinkered in those terms. And then adding to that and i think your book conveys this pretty well actually but it's it's something that i first glommed onto for, i guess a book that's 20 years old now called the discipline mind by jeff smith mm -hmm. that talks about how uh, academia does train you to view certain social problems in certain ways including ways about like 
being seen as a victim is actually good because it gets you accommodations in the meritocratic structure, which is like not something that would have occurred to my parents. Like no one wanted to be seen as, you know, as uh, someone who could not support themselves, et cetera. Like that would, there's no benefit to that really. Mm. Um, and so these cultural movements, it, it just changes the whole framework because the one thing I can say you know, you, you talked about Occupy as a small thing. I'll talk about an even smaller thing, but it has tons of left, like, mi mi basically mythology is my visit uh, when I was a, a young gutter punk uh, to Seattle, which was my first time leaving the southeast um, outside of, you know, living with my dad in Canada for a little bit. <clears throat> but um, And my first encounter with leftist you know, not in a zine form. And uh, I became a reactionary for five years. <laughs> like it was, yeah. it, it was just my first encounter with that. It was utterly unattractive to me. Right. Um, and even though they were fighting about things I very much cared about, which was like the gutting of whole areas. And in my case, it was the gutting of the urban South East, but they weren't, they, the, the culture that was particular I mean, in the late 90s, is probably even worse, but the culture that in the way they spoke was totally alienating to someone who was not college educated. And I wasn't yet. I was 19 years old. So. Right. Um, and what I find interesting and I guess what surprised me, uh, and this is a small thing, but the amount of like language changes that I used to know from academia when I was coming up in academia in the early aughts, like that we had this particular way of speaking, but no one else spoke that way. Um, it's different than now, but, you know, I remember talking about heteronormativity <clears throat> and this, that and the other. Um, and one of the things when I was abroad, I mean, uh, I, w I was outside of the United States, actually, when most of these movements that you were writing about were happening. And... I just remember being shocked how the academic language of activists moved into <clears throat> media significantly faster than I'd ever seen before. Um, so, for example, uh, Latinx, which you know, I I I do non I do non gender it, but I don't use it because I it doesn't sound natural in English or Spanish, so I just say Latin. But um, it never made sense to me to indicate something by making by by uh creating a word that doesn't work in either language when you can just say the word in english and it's non-gendered um but uh nonetheless i saw that change move into media like in three to five years from when it was being kind of adopted in academia another one i saw was bipoc which happened incredibly fast um <clears throat> when i first saw it in academia in the mid aught teens and then like by 2020, it's being used in common parlance uh, in, in the broader media. And that indicated to me something had changed both around strategy and around like cultural uh, saturation that this, that like left, you know, left academic ways of speaking were being adopted in the media super fast, but they weren't being adopted in like the regular world. Um, that it was becoming like a cultural indicator uh, even more than it had been in the past not a cultural indication of just education but a cultural indicator of like politics as an identity mm -hmm. um so it did seem to me for that to happen it also meant that like these activist changes were happening at fairly elite institutions and getting into like mm -hmm. editorial boards and whatnot significantly faster than they had had than they had not really done in the 90s and early aughts right. so um, i mean the, the way that i would put it is um the 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 advantage of staying abreast of the correct terminology, the correct signaling, the correct uh, sort of cultural positioning on these things, that advantage is a Veblen good, right? So like for, for those watching at home, a Veblen good is a, 
it's something that has the, the unusual circumstance where the higher the price goes, the higher the demand goes, right? Um, and what I mean by that is that the more difficult it becomes to stay abreast of and express the correct vocabulary and to know BIPOC rather than POC and to know Latinx um, rather than Latino or Latino, to be, you know, be able to identify a bell hooks quote or to be able to um, <clears throat> discuss, you know, who Gloria Anzaldúa is, right? Um, the, the higher the bar gets for maintaining that kind of knowledge, the more attractive it is to the people who pursue that standpoint, right? Because it becomes more exclusionary, right? Like the, 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 the laurel of having that uh, position uh, increases as the difficulty in maintaining that position increases as well. And you can sort of connect this back to what you were saying earlier about <clears throat> not being able to afford a house, right? We have this whole sort of discourse of the economically screwed millennial. Um, the degree to which that is or is not true is sort of challenged by some people. Um, certainly it's true that the ability to buy your own home is dramatically harder than it was for some prior uh, generations um, <clears throat> because of a chronic undersupply problem and now high interest rates as well as high prices. Um, uh, if you are someone who, who uh, finds yourself in the position of being highly educated uh, <clears throat> and also living in a situation in which the cost of housing has never been higher in relative or, or absolute terms. The cost of medical care has never been higher in, re in relative or absolute terms. Uh, the cost of education and child, child care has never been higher uh, in absolute or relative terms. Um, <clears throat> then you might say, what kind of uh, virtues therefore can I pursue, right? Like what kind of goods can I pursue? What is, what is the, the thing that I can go after? If I just don't believe I'll ever, I'm ever going to have the house with the garage and the car and the picket fence, um, I think it becomes more attractive to uh, <clears throat> sort of want to cover yourself in virtue uh, through the means of uh, your uh, adherence to a particular sort of worldview uh, of uh, <clears throat> like, you know, what it means to be a good person. And it's worth saying... You know, as we speak, it appears that uh, Ibram Kendi's anti-racist anti center at BU is in the process of disintegrating, right? Um, it, but the existence of that, of a, uh, you know, specifically anti-racist center uh, funded to the point of like $43 million, I think, since it started in 2020, um, that should be a clue to us that, you know, this stuff became the language of institutions, Right. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of people sort of want to push back at me on this, but I think it is ju just genuinely the case that um, the language of institutions is the language of social justice. Absolutely. And, yeah. And it's not just it's not just the usual suspects. Right. Like the Defense Department, if you read their press releases now. Right. They do the Stations of the Cross for uh, social justice. Uh, defense manufacturers use this language. Uh, investment banks use this language. Private prison companies use this language, right? Um, the, as you said, the takeover of from academia to media, but then also from media to everywhere else was just stunningly rapid. And the interesting thing about it is you almost can't find anyone who defends the sincerity of any of this. Like, I, I know no one who says like, oh yeah, no, it's it's really great that Raytheon uh, has a you know a pride float in the pride parade now. No one says that like it's great that Goldman Sachs uh, you know has anti-racist language in their employee handbook. No one no one trusts it. Everyone sees it as bullshit, and yet it still exists, right? There there is still this this internal pressure to sort of make those sort of signals happen. Um, and in many ways, you know, as much as I'm critical, I, I I can only admire the incredible mimetic power of this discourse, right? Like the the ability of this meme, right? Because all this all this social justice talk, you can see it like as a meme, the the, the speed and rapidity uh, and comprehensiveness of with which it spread is really remarkable. <clears throat> to, to speak to your point, I was taking a. 
I teach a class on um, on college readiness to students who uh, who opt to take it, but mostly students from low social economic uh, are quote racially disadvantaged background. And again, already speaks to what you're talking about. But we'd expect that that's a state institution. Uh, we went to a bunch of the universities, and I went to BYU. <laughs> And BYU probably, you know, is about as conservative as you're going to get unless you're going to like Liberty University or something. Um, and even at that school where they were bragging about praying before every class, they were also pointing out that they had a diversity, inclusion, and belonging. They didn't say equity, but belonging program. And it just, I was like, if even BYU, which represents the most conservative faction of like the LDS, is using this language, it actually means it's permeated culture so significantly that we can't even say that it ha that it's even particularly strongly associated with the left, our wokeism, our whatever, because mm -hmm. even BYU, which openly touts its conservative values, so much so that it's risk accreditation for certain programs, still feels the need <clears throat> to use this language to appeal to I'm not even quite sure who, but you it's, know. it's BYU still a school where uh, unmarried students are forbidden from having consensual sex with each other. Right? Absolutely. And yeah. it, uh, as is drinking, even if you're over 21. So, right. yes, uh, as is having a beard. But um, it, it's it's a very conservative school. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how there are certain kinds of cultural signifiers we don't do here in in Utah, um, a lot of the ones around like uh, gender in inclusivity, mm -hmm. but even there, we just, it's not even like uh, in Florida, it's just systemically, we don't talk about it one way or the other. And we do talk about diversity and inclusion constantly. Yeah. It's like a prime value, despite the political context, despite bonds for liberty, despite everything mm -hmm. else, which does indicate to me that there is some capital to that. And I think you're right that it has to do with the fact that like other meritocratic goods no longer seem possible even to fairly elite people. So what do you have? Um, I, I think that it, it, it seems bizarre to me that people push back on you <laughs> that this has become an institutional value right. because it, it's, it, it's like, I was actually ask you, why do you think people push back on you in that? Because because if anything, yes, it might have been loosened a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Um, I mean, we have seen like private corporations, D DEI programs are being wound down because a lot of them, A, they are expensive, but they don't seem to be effective even by their stated goals. So there does seem to be a slight move away from that. But um in general, it seems to permeate a whole lot of elite and midbrow culture to an extent that you're right. Other kinds of cultural movements on the left, <clears throat> maybe if we go back to the new, I'm not sure if new left stuff actually changed language in the same way that this stuff did, but that's the only other time I could think about this. None of the Gen X <coughs> were able to do this, for example. Right. Um, so like the, the analogy that I would make is to like optimism. So optimism is a philosophy of sort of music criticism that uh, holds that uh, traditionally pop music has been systematically undervalued by critics who prefer uh, rock music and that uh, in particular critics tend to asso associate uh, <clears throat> the conventions of various ki kinds of rock music with seriousness and sort of the official line of optimism is just to say that pop music deserves to be taken as seriously as any other kind and, and, and shouldn't be systematically uh, devalued in uh, pop in uh, music criticism, which of course that's perfectly inoffensive. But what pop, pop, pop optimism actually functions as in as like an actual lived practice um, is just like the desire for like hegemonic uh, uh, sort of pop uh, sort of dominance over everything that like if you actually look at like what I mean the the sort of original generation of optimist theorists like Khalifa Senna 
would say, uh, oh, the point of optimism is not that pop is better than other kinds of music. But if you actually look at the people who invoke optimism in 2023, it's people who very much believe that pop is better than other kinds of music. Um, so the, the, my analogy here is because um, <clears throat> optimism has become the dominant uh, sort of mode in music criticism. Uh, publications like Pitchfork are yep. just, uh, I mean, it is almost. Uh, uh, I thought they were insufferable back in the day when they were when they were uh, indie rock elitists, but I actually find them way more insufferable now. <laughs> right. Like... So, yeah, but also, but it's and it's it's not just uh, Pitchfork. I mean, the, what were once considered the temples of rockism, so called, um, like Rolling Stone and Spin, have gone very hard in the direction of popism in order to said to demonstrate we're not this thing. Okay, so what, what was my point? My point is, is that people who sort of associate themselves with optimism um, want to pretend that this is not true. Um, they they still talk about optimism as though it's like a uh, rebel child who uh, is fighting against the man. They describe a world that's now sort of decades out of date in terms of what is actually happening at uh uh, sort of, you know, major music publications. I uh, would challenge any of your listeners to just find any negative uh, reviews of K-pop. I just find any, find find any negative reviews of K-pop in major publications. But the people who who push optimism um, insist that uh, it's still 2004, right? Um, that insist that nothing has changed. Insist that pop is still disrespected and we're in a world in which uh there are multiple universities that have taylor swift classes there's a taylor swift academic conference uh nyu made one of its essay questions for its application about taylor swift right like um it, but that position of being the sort of the reviled underdog is very comfortable for people it's emotionally sort of soothing they like to be in the position of sort of like saying the whole world is against me and I'm on my own. It's very much the same way with a lot of the sort of social justice sort of nomenclature and vocabulary and orientation where, um, you know, I, I, I was in a, a, a humanities PhD program in the middle of the 2010s uh, where Obviously, social justice politics were just the dominant. I mean, just hegemonic. Yeah, you couldn't of... question it. And could, when my right. friends in uh, in composition and English programs, uh, literally, if they and a lot of them are leftist, even, mm -hmm. but uh, if they questioned certain things, they were pretty much chased out of the program. I right. mean, it was you know you I mean, that that was the scenario. But you would then go to conferences in the field and people would say, uh, and the keynote speech would be all about how, you know, uh, social justice politics are, uh, are, are forbidden rebel discourse in the, in the academy. And I mean, that's, just, that's, why, that's why people sort of, you know, maintain the fiction that this is not the, the language of institutions because um, they'd rather sort of lose nobly than win, right? And they would rather uh, pretend that uh, <clears throat> that they're still like the sort of beleaguered underdogs in part because they can then claim that their ideas have never been tried uh, in order to see their failure. To, to me though, that's not, I mean, I think you're correct. It's just that part of this is not new. I remember like uh, Juno Diaz, I mean, before he got canceled, um, talking about you know how we st complaining about i b believe it was alice monroe winning uh <clears throat> some prize and talking about how you know no one read tony morrison in college and i was like i had two whole classes devoted to tony morrison in 2002 <clears throat> like yeah. in, in fact, <laughs> um, for a long for a long period beloved beloved was the single most assigned book in american colleges and universities so, you know, it, it's, I mean, it often leads to, and I think you wrote about this, but it also has often led to some very superficial uh, literary comparisons, like people who compare Alice Walker, uh, Maya Angelou, and Toni Morrison as if they're the right. same kind of writer. And I'm like, the only thing they share is they're Black women. Like, yeah. Yeah. those are radically different writers. And 
frankly, radically different qualities of writers, uh, too. So it's, it is, um, it seems wild to me that, that that would be, that people would pretend that I read a whole lot of Alice Munro in college and not a whole lot of Alice Walker, even in where I was educated in the fairly deep South. So it was, it, I just rolled my eyes at that. And that was, that was like 12, 13 years ago. And it seems like that rhetoric has only intensified. Um, and it is the one thing I say has changed is I used to associate that primarily with like fairly elite discourse patterns, but I think you see it in like nerd culture ubiquitously too. Mm, of course. Um, you know, so you, you know, know the the ultimate underdog, Star Wars. You know, like the, yeah. the the most powerful entertainment franchise in history, or whatever. But but you know, someone made fun of someone's lunchbox twenty years ago, so that therefore it is permanently an underdog. Yeah, yeah, and well, even like the pretending that we still live in a in a world where the only best selling like uh, sci fi or fantasy authors are white men and i'm like that hasn't really been the case in about at least a decade i mean it it did happen later than in literary fiction but like uh it or you know oh it's only like old white dudes who play DD. that's just dramatically not true anymore i mean it's these cultural discourses interest me because it does seem like the denial of hegemony seems to be a part of the project. And I guess to bring it back to something you were talking about in the beginning, but I guess I do want your thoughts on this. I assume that a lot of these people are sincere on one hand, but there is a kind of cultural capital mongering involved in this on the other. And those two impulses do seem hard to square because one of these is cynical and one of these is not. I, I think they're both true. But mm-hmm. how do you square that? Yeah, I, I just I just think that we're, we're very self-deceiving beings, right? Like, I mean, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's also, we we sort of lived in, it's, it's hard to know what anyone sort of sincerely thought because we've lived in for a decade or more um, in a uh, rhetorical environment in which the price for stepping out of line was potentially like personal destruction, right? Like, um, so, uh, so Rob Amari, uh, who is the editor of Compact Magazine and uh, wrote a book called Tyranny Inc., uh, came out recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said that um, you can, you know, <clears throat> you can date the dawn of the social justice age uh, to the day in 2013 when Justine Sacco uh, was, was canceled. So for everybody out there, uh, Justine Sacco was a completely random PR expert, PR person, I think, uh, who was going on a trip to South Africa. And at the airport, she tweeted, um, I'm off to South Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS. Uh, Haha, just kidding. I'm white. Um, And as was sort of a lot of people sort of admitted after the fact, like, that was just a very sort of clumsy attempt at a at an anti-racist joke. Like the the idea being that like you know she had access to privileges that poor African people didn't, but it really didn't land. Uh, but she was in the air. I think it's like a ten-hour flight to Johannesburg or whatever, and so she was in the air. And while that happened, um, she faced the most sort of vicious sort of cancellation that's ever happened in the history of man. Uh, and Twitter just went insane. Uh, I believe she was fired literally before her plane touched down um, by by her firm because of the of the bad press, um, which must have been a hell of a thing to uh, discover when you turn your phone back on when you get to the airport. Um, but uh, you know that sort of has been the, the sort of rhetorical environment that we've been in for a long time, right? Like it's just it's hard to have a normal politics or to have a a sense of who's sincere and who's not, or who's playing politics or who's not, who's really on the team and who's not when um, people, you know, most people just sort of fear um, the sort of the ax swinging against them in getting fired like David Shore did or getting mobbed like Lee Fong did or et cetera, et cetera. Um, There was uh, the, a woman who, um, 
trying to think of what the university was, but she uh, had, there was a protest and a trucker had parked his truck in order to, to prevent um, the protesters from getting hit by cars because they were obstructing the roadway. And this white college student thanked the trucker and said, if it weren't for you, for you uh, these, all these people would be speed bumps. And then a, a, a black student heard that and said that she was saying, oh, all these people would make good speed bumps. In other words, inverting sort of the intent of what she had to say. Uh, and she faced enormous backlash on, on campus and became a pariah. Um, that's just not like normal. And we're not really built to be a, operating in, uh, in <clears throat> sort of places and sort of discursive environments like that. Uh, it just, it distorts everything so much. It makes the incentive so fucked up that it's hard to say who's sincere about what. I mean, I, you know, people assume that like going to, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a be, work, you know, being in an English department in a PhD program in, uh, <clears throat> you know, the mid 2010s as I was, um, uh, I mean, I was in sort of like assessment and more statsy sort of stuff. So I guess it's a little different, but, um, uh, you know, people assume that everybody has like was like super overbearingly woke and it was like, well, officially they were right. But um, almost everyone, you know, was pretty clear about the fact that they were doing it out of sort of self-defensive purposes. Right. Like, it, I mean, look, they were liberal Democrats and they believed in a lot of the stuff we were reading and talking about. Um, but you just never knew because everybody was operating but from behind this layer of armor saying, I'm trying to get a job in the humanities as a professor in the 2010s. I have to be 100% Teflon when it comes to the shit that I say politically. Uh, and I'm just not going to hang myself out there. And, and so that's where we've been for a long time. Well, I think one of the problems with academia is it, there's a whole lot of predicated on modeling a kind of coercive theory of mind, even before wokeness i mean like uh picking the wrong advisor as you know will end your career and there's no way for you to know that unless you're hyper socially aware right uh, when you're in a program but i totally see how that culture plus this is it plus twitter i mean one of the things i was shocked by uh that happened in the 2010s was was the number of academics who were willing to do things that i was always told you never did on Twitter, seemingly to some kind of competitive advantage to prove their politics. Right. And that, that was sort of shocking to me because, you know, I, I guess I came, when I was coming through school and you and I are about the same age, I dropped out of a PhD program before I really got into it. So, um, but I have a terminal degree, I get my MFA and um, I just remember being told don't blog like ever, right. <laughs> like, like that you will regret it until you have tenure. And I have seen stuff since then that has been, frankly, shocking in in the way people will go after other academics on Twitter in ways that betray both a, a, a facile politics, but also that it does seem to be a way to, like, do interdepartmental fights in a way you couldn't before because now it's out in the public. And... I also basically heard from, you know, my more liberal psychological friends that this was actually a good thing. And I'm like, why do you think it's a good thing? You're just encouraging people to hide their positions and and totally engage in doublethink. And um, now you really don't know. you like as a signaling apparatus, this no longer works. You know, like if everybody signals some level of this except for the most reprobate people who make a career out of being reprobate then this as a signaling function doesn't even mean that much mm -hmm. um and i got weird looks but it, it, it it's kind of what i've thought about it because it's like, like i've mentioned with byu if this is if this is hegemonic it also means that like almost like a goodly portion of the people who do this at least have double think around it. I'm not going to say they don't believe it, but they believe contradictory things. Mm -hmm. And it really shows up to me when you see, when like you look at like voting patterns versus expression patterns and whatnot, where people feel more safe. And it's just like, yeah, this is not as deep as people seem to think it is. Um, 
or there's harder limits to it than people seem to realize. And, and I think that that's interesting, but it does kind of bring me to the beginning of your book to kind of circle back around. Mm. How does it feel like, even though the, even though the progressives kind of sort of got what they want in the case of Joe Biden, that 2020 just didn't happen. Mm. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, a lot of people who have done interviews with it asked, like, you know, what motivated you to write this book? And for me, it was just a feeling that I was going crazy because I was sort of, it was like 2022. I sold, I sold the book officially in May of 2022. I uh, <clears throat> was working on the, probably started working on the uh, uh, proposal in February or March. Um, and I just thought, like, I looked around and I said, weren't we just talking about like a revolutionary moment, right? I mean, it's it's really interesting because the n sort of nonpartisan politics, the sort of outside of establishment politics, outside of Congress and sort of thing, like uh, the, the, the sort of activist left was supposed to be in a revolutionary moment, whereas Joe Biden was supposed to be the extremely safe, moderate Clintonite kind of choice um, who wouldn't do anything. Um, and it's kind of like flipped, right? Where the activist less appears more or less to have given up, right? Uh, Black Lives Matter collapsed under all the graft and all the grift or whatever you call it. And uh, um, there's increasing disgust with the organizations of Black Lives Matter within the Black activist class. Um, right. uh, <clears throat> And Although Joe white Biden, leftists are weirdly silent about the problems with the uh, with the unaccountability in the fifty organizations, many of which turned out to be grifting because there was no control over the over the the hashtag and yeah. and uh, I've I, I think interestingly you're right that I've heard more about that from black activists and white activists who feel very uncomfortable talking about it as if right. they're ceding some point to the right and that always makes me uncomfortable freddie because it, it to, when when we refuse to talk about that stuff it makes it look like we're totally afraid to deal with these events and i guess because well we are um yeah. but yeah we'll get, let you go back to what you're saying no but i well i mean look like yeah i mean look like um as with essentially any uh progressive movement you can name uh the sort of anti-racist slash uh black power slash civil rights slash whatever movement um its history is strewn with uh with grifters and with cons and etc cetera, etc cetera. that in and of itself doesn't tell you much about the politics underlying it but again it gets back to the moment right where um who was going to be the one to stick their neck out and say hey where's all this fucking money going right um i looked at a ton of numbers for the book uh and uh it's you know there's just there's just many different sort of estimates there's no there's no doubt that the amount of money donated in the name of black lives matter in various ways was in the tens of billions of dollars and it at least rivals 911 as the biggest overall charitable co you know, sort of contribution sort of uh thing in, in in history um and nobody knows where the money went uh there's a reporter uh, for New York Magazine who is black, so he's offered at least a degree of protection about this, who wrote a couple of essential stories about the fact that, you know, hey, this just looks like people are just spending this in houses and, and a lot of it's missing and nobody knows. Um, but, you know, it, who in, you know, November of 2020 was going to say, boy, you know, it sure seems like there's a shitload of money getting sort of pushed around and absolutely minimal coherence about what, who is getting what and what it's for and where it's going to go. Um, nobody was going to make that. No one's going to be the person to stick their neck out and say that uh, at the time. And if they were, they were probably a conservative and so they'd be ignored anyway. Uh, you know, for me, <clears throat> um, just to return to the point about Joe Biden, um, you know, he's a, he's an establishment politician He's a president, and you know, and all presidents are war criminals. There's a million things that I wish he'd do differently. Uh, I do think that he is the best president of my lifetime, um, barring some sort of, you know, terrible sort of collapse, and uh, barring him inv invading Iran or something. Um, he's, uh, you know, 
he's been much more aggressive with expanding uh, government spending and the sort of the role of the social state than I possibly could have imagined. And, uh, you know, if you're someone like me, it's an uncomfortable moment to be in where the activist left, left sort of collapses in on itself, where many of the people who sort of considered themselves part of the activist left suddenly started pretending like they weren't into this, you know? I mean, this is one of the weird things. Again, like the reason I wrote the book is it just was like, I knew individual people who had been blaring and bleeding about Black Lives Matter every day uh, for a year and a half who just sort of stopped when it became clear that nothing was going to happen. And when every, a bunch of people just sort of suddenly wanted to move on. Um, uh, and then meanwhile, right, like the sort of esta- the ultimate establishmentarian, Joe Biden, the ultimate insider, Right, like the, the senator from MasterCard, uh, who had one of the most horrific re- records as a senator in the entirety of the 1990s as a Democrat, um, you know, for 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 him to sort of be delivering where the activists left failed uh, is not a comfortable position for me to be in. Hmm. I'm not as much as a fan as Joe Biden as you, although I, I agree that he might be the best president of our lifetime. But that's uh, I mean, it's it's a, it's a damning low bar. Me- Permanently low bar, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, it, it's g- given that my lifetime starts with Reagan. It's my, my entire lifetime is a series of disappointments around Same, executive, yeah. right? But um, and if I'd have been born, I mean, I guess I was technically born in the Carter administration, but I don't remember it. But that would also have been equally disappointing, really. So, you know. I, 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 I do think it's interesting, and I do think it's interesting that I don't think Joe Biden's going to get a lot of credit for this either. Um, uh, for- I mean, it, it looks like he's going to lose, which is just abs- insane to me. Like, I, I don't, you know, um, the economy is pretty damn good right now. It's just the vibes are off. And people think, and people think the economy is worse than it is because I'm convinced that... Um, part of the reason people think the economy is worse than it is is because like influencer finance things like on TikTok, on youtube on instagram like the whole world of like finance gurus and influencers or whatever um they have a like a permanent sort of um incentive to say that the economy is about to collapse like if you go on youtube and click around and look at the various youtube videos um so all the all the videos with the, with the most views are those that say that we're about to have the next Great Depression, right? Uh, and I really think that that might be help, sort of helping to drag down Joe Biden's numbers. But um, he got, I mean, like he's, I guess he's still paying a price for getting us out of Afghanistan, which is one of the best things that a president has done in my lifetime, you know? So it, it's all so weird and frustrating. Uh, yeah, I'm... I am torn on the economic data. I do think the economy is way better than I would have expected it to be, frankly. Mm-hmm. And um, and yet I also think some of the malaise is real. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult for me to parse what's going on. And it's also very difficult for me to imagine what's going to happen. Let's say Trump wins and... 2024 uh and like he's not in prison doesn't die whatever uh i also don't see like the kind of response to trump round two even though theoretically it might be more dangerous than trump round one being the same because these people have deactivated and are exhausted right like i just like when people talk about trump i just can't see it being that heightened for another four years i'm wrong but i i I can guarantee you that we will not have the same women's march right Mm -hmm. the the women's march was like the biggest protest in american history or whatever Mm -hmm. uh with the pink pussy hats and everything that's not happening for trump part two right and you're right i think i think exhausted and i think exhausted burnt out shell-shocked like you know, there's all this talk about this, like about a vibe shift or whatever, and uh, you know, I'm naturally skeptic of that kind of language, but uh, I do think that things have changed. But like, the biggest thing is just that like, no one has the fucking energy to do this anymore, right? Like, and it's, this is this was sort of a core sort of message of the book is just that like, I'm not sure if this analogy made it into the book, but I've used it before, which is that. Um, 
after 9-11, right, one of the things people said is we must be eternally vigilant. We have to be et et eternally vigilant. And you, they'd say, we have to keep an eye on everywhere. We have to keep a special eye on everywhere. And you'd say, well, where do we need to look especially? And they'd say everywhere. We'd have to look everywhere, right? And the point that you had to make, that you wanted to make to these people is like, if it's eternal, it cannot be vigilance, right? Right. And if it's universal, then you're not actually, if if you're keeping a, you know, a close eye on everywhere, you're not keeping a close eye on anywhere, right? That like you, it's, it's not possible for people to maintain this perpetual state of emotional excitation all the time. We're not built as, 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 as sort of as animals uh, to do that. And one of the demands of the George Floyd moment was to, to, was to maintain that same feeling in perpetuity. Uh, that that could never have happened. It's just asking too much of people. And then when there was a failure to sort of make structural change or administrative change uh, in the name of George Floyd, it guaranteed that nothing was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we got we got some cultural change, and that was about it. And even that cultural change hasn't stuck around particularly long. Um, I mean, I. I, I am fascinated by by a thesis that I've had that 9/11 has become like the thing that we all kind of proclaim we've gotten over, but our whole fundamental attitude towards security being everything and that being the primary motivator for everything mm -hmm. has infiltrated all of society in ways that to me are a little bit shocking. Mm -hmm. um, like the this it is true that that like most lone wolf terrorists in america have been of some degree light right wing um but the amount of fear put on say like say right wing terrorism for example it actually feels to me similar to the amount of fear put on islamic terrorism in in uh the aughts because right. it's still relatively rare and for it to be touted as like we particularly in 2020, and this is something that I was going to ask you, you don't talk about as much in your book, but all the civil war talk right. that I thought was just absurd, um, you know, uh, that, I, that I was just like, you, you literally think like the Proud Boys are going to lead a war against like liberals and the military is just going to let it happen? Like that, and you're talking about that in a way... Like, I remember these interviews from 538 to NPR that were talking about that. And if you pushed on people, they'd be like, okay, we don't actually mean that. We mean something like an increase of domestic terrorism. And and my response was kind of like, we've actually had a deficit of domestic terrorism in the last, right. you know, since the late 90s, frankly. Um, if you look at, like, the long durée of 20th century American history, only during, like... Uh, World War II and the post-war consensus, what, were we not a particularly violent country? Right. So, I, not to say that it's, not to say that this is good, but it doesn't seem to me to be this this uh, new, new thing. And I remember talking to people, even old people, who, who remembered the 70s telling me, like, oh, we've never been this divided. And I was like, did I... Did, right. did you just say the seventies basically didn't happen? Like right. we were assassinating political figures all the time. Like, yeah. what are we on? Um, but I mean, you know, like you, you, I, I, I would use the term safetyism to sort of refer to the the sort of cross sort of cross ideological American sort of assumption, and you can totally see, you know, like liberal helicopter parents. Who are the kinds of people who would swear up and down that they would never be influenced by 9-11, but where their approach to life and to parenting is still sort of based on the sort of the sense of like perpetual fear and we have to put security above all, all other things. Um, someone I know, uh, his daughter, I think she's like 11 years old and um, she's in a basketball league and one of her teammates took a, a bad elbow across the face then she broke her nose and she had a lot of blood coming out of her nose. Um, 
which is unfortunate, but she'll be fine. And, you know, these things happen. But um, the league <clears throat> didn't just stop, you know, cancel the game and send everybody home. Um, they they then sent emails to all the parents saying that they were offering access to therapist services for any of the kids who witnessed that and needed additional support. Um, and it's like, you know, the, the, the sense that it, there's a real weird combination of a security state with a sort of um, rapaciously therapeutic approach to everything, right? Like this, this constant, constant, constant uh, expansion of uh, therapy, uh, sort of sort of therapy as like the dominant mental model of uh, American life. Um, that is, you know, incredibly discouraging for me. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm almost uh, happy to know that like, as our political system seems to be sort of slowly shuffling a little bit more in the direction of the kind of politics that I have, um, I just become more and more alienated by my culture all the time. So I'll always have something to write about. But uh, um, the this the sense that like uh, you know trauma has become the sort of the definition of how we understand uh, various elements of human suffering that the therapeutic model, whether it's actually in therapy or just people using therapy concept and vocabulary all the time. I mean, it just slides so gracefully into the assumption that, um, you know, uh, you can't bring liquids onto a plane. Right. Yeah. It does seem like the revenge of feel reef in some ways. Um, you know, the triumph of the therapeutic to the point, you know, you've talked about your mental health issues. I don't talk about mine as much, but I, I actually am diagnosed with severe PTSD. Um, and the trauma talk, I actually find, I thought I would find it liberating um, uh, because, oh, well, finally, like this part of my life is now in popular discourse. I actually find it incredibly alienating because mm -hmm. uh, the threshold for what for what counts and the identification with it uh, is is somewhat terrifying to me. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, maybe that's my own psychological issues. I don't know, but it, it it is something that that does not sit well with me to see us like talk about everything i mean it, it started with the with the switching of offense to triggering right. like as if you know and trigger warnings which i which a lot of people who you know had ptsd warned were not uh, the way it was being used and even in left culture didn't actually mirror trauma triggers at all and that you know you, it's not that easily predictable nor obvious um right. and that is only intensified. I thought maybe we'd be moving away from. Uh, my first concern actually goes about back about 15, 20 years when I started seeing language of social justice being framed in psychological language, such as microaggressions, which is a psychological thing. Right. And an implicit and explicit bias, which, we, yes, we've moved away from a little bit, as, but that was a huge thing in the aught team. <laughs> Um, and now, and collapsing all that, I mean, that was Abraham X. Kendi's big move, even though I, I actually like parts of his first book, but like, um, the whole, like, we, we, we need to, bigotry, systemic racism, and implicit bias should all be the same thing. Racism was like, wait, why would you do that? Those are, those have different fixes. They have different demands on people some of them are easier to tackle than others like um you know certain policy decisions you're going to make aren't going to do anything about implicit bias certain uh bigotry like you know is dangerous between individuals but it, it but unless it like dominates the culture it's not nearly as a big a problem as systemic racism why would you collapse all those things mm -hmm. and similarly i feel that way with trauma to the point that now i mean uh, yes, you and I are both going to sound like old guys complaining about TikTok, but like psychological conditions being seen as positive identities is a little intense for me. And and I say this as a person who 
really thinks we we did need to destigmatize mental health. Like, you know, that people could talk about this stuff. I just didn't think like talking about it meant talking like now these are like who we are. I mean, look, like the, one of my obsessions is just the way that perfectly reasonable ideas are downstream of absurd behaviors and expressions that are sort of sort of you know, taken underneath the, the sort of I just of those uh, reasonable ideas. So like, like I said, optimism before, right? The, the sort of the, the like boilerplate sort of stock definition of what optimism is and was and was for is perfectly fine, right? In the world, optimism is if I say, I don't care for the music of Ariana Grande on Twitter, someone will dox me, right? And try to burn my house down, right? Like that, like that's what's sort of downstream from there. Mm -hmm. trauma talk is very much the same right um there is a there was a tweet that i saw that i thought was pretty funny and it's just it just says uh oh um i'm I, i'm sorry i didn't know you have trauma uh you can go back to being mean to me now right which me which is in other words trauma talk was not supposed to be a free-floating excuse for you to do and want and w whatever you want right like trauma talk was not supposed to be uh, sort of this excuse architecture that sort of sets you up uh, in such a way that uh, it enables you to say everything that I want is what I want and what I should get. And anything that I don't get is uh, is injustice. And if you get mad about the way that I act, then that's ableism because I can't help it because of my trauma. Um, uh, and this is why, like, I think, you know, medical things should stay in the medical field why we shouldn't have therapy creep into our everyday language um, because, you know, uh, trauma is real and it's something that needs to be addressed clinically, right. For many people to be able to live healthy and happy lives. Um, but that's just not helped by someone posting an Instagram meme uh, about trauma. And I, one thing that I, you know, I sort of challenge people who are sort of in that world on is, um, you know, does everyone have trauma? Which is a, a question that I think people have a hard time answering. On the one hand, according to the world in which we live now, where again, seeing another little girl, seeing another 11 year old get a broken nose is now presumed to be a traumatic enough experience to require therapy. Um, uh, then the answer would seem to be yes, right? Because everyone endures hardship in their lives and in, in their young lives. Um, but the problem with universalizing trauma as an experience is the whole point of that discourse is to create special dispensation for people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. Like the problem with just letting the TikTok kids dictate who has mental illness and was saying, oh, sure, they're probably faking it, but but they have, but they let them pretend they have Tourette's. Let them pre pretend they have dissociative identity disorder. Uh, let let them say they have borderline personality disorder. What's what's the harm? The harm is is that you know we create special accommodations for people who have disabilities, um, but accommodations are, are inevitably zero sum, right? Like in other words, you once you accommodate everyone, it ceases to be an accommodation at all. So because I write so much about disability and this stuff. I, you know, I get emails from people and, and uh, I've gotten a couple from um, people who are teaching, whether in high school or in college, where, um, you know, something like three quarters of the class has a diagnosis that gives them extra time to work on tests and various things such as that. Yeah, almost everybody has a 504. And the thing about a 504 accommodation, I should be very careful saying this because this actually could cost, uh, uh, is you can kind of buy it. Because all it takes is a is a is a doctor's notice of anything that could possibly require accommodation, and you know. But some... I mean, here's, here's I mean I think here's here's the essential point though, right? Like uh -huh. at the point where it's like three quarters of the people in a college class have are being given an, an accommodation on a test, that ceases to be an accommodation for the disabled minority, and is now instead a disadvantage for actually the able-bodied minority, right? In other words, that like at some point in accommodation, when accommodations become universal, uh, they uh, uh, inevitably become uh, just sort of uh, hurting anyone who doesn't necessarily demand the accommodation, which of course 
continues to incentivize the behavior for, of more and more people seeking accommodation and diagnoses. Well, I mean, we've talked about this in, in terms of education, and uh, people can go listen to one of my early, one of my first interviews, which was you on education. And yeah, you know, I work as a teacher. Um, yep. We've known about each other probably for a decade. Yep. But um, one of the things that I will just tell you, it goes into our classroom design now, is we now design that all accommodations are pre built into the to to as best as we can. There are some things we can't, but that most of the common accommodations are just automatically built into the program for everybody because we see that problem. And particularly when it, when it's like, I have to keep up with, also I have 220 students and I have to keep up with 110 separate accommodations. I'm going to, or actually more than that, probably like 250, I mean 150 out of 210 accommodations. I'm just going to build towards the most common accommodations across the board. Now that might be progressive, it might not, I am torn on it because I'll tell you what I see. What I see is graduation rates going up, but remediation rates at college is right. exploding. Um, and then a lot of kids uh, graduating with that, that I think if we tested them, they, a lot of them are going to college anymore. Now that's another trend that's changing. But uh, if we tested them, we discovered they were entering adulthood with barely functional literacy. Right. Um, and and uh, so are these accommodations helping everyone or is it just raising um, graduation rates? And and I point out the people who, you know, there's this writer cuts about about wokeness being the reason why this is happening. But I point out that this happens in conservative states, too. It's just framed differently. In Utah, it's framed over parent choice. Right. Like. But the same, it's the same effect. We don't measure as much. We, we, uh, we moved away from standardized testing, which I, I will tell, I'd be the first person to say we over relied on it in the aughts, right? But now m my big argument, and this is one of the things that can kind of get us to the end of your book about class, mm -hmm. but in all these discussions about diversity and particularly in education, economic diversity has decreased significantly and precipitously the, the the more we move away from standardized tests and i know you've written about for example grade bias in aggregate being actually worse even racially down mm -hmm. to like skin tone not just racial type right. um in in grades and yet no one's calling for us to abolish grades right. uh and that uh, i think you've also written about I believe on your blog, uh, on your Substack, that that uh, we also have seen um, the way that things like uh, diversity statements actually code for class upwardly. So, like, you have to be a certain social class to write a good diversity statement. Like, mm -hmm. there's like to be able to say you've done this and this free internship to help in this and this social justice cause, which you had to do for free, which would require additional resources, et cetera. And it doesn't seem to me, it seems to me that every year I see this whole, there's a, there's even less economic diversity in universities, which on one hand is indicating that, and maybe correctly, that people are no longer seeing them as a way out of their, out of their social class predicament. And, in a perverse way, that may be a good thing. But on the other hand, it's also indicating to me that all this diversity is like really, really thin and thin. And so that the social justice isn't really helping the people it's saying it's aiming to help. I mean, like to me, when I look at, for example, that like racial poverty as a percentage, racialized poverty as a percentage has been kind of stagnant since 2010 is something that's like, we should be ashamed of that, um, even from the standpoint of racial justice, and yet that doesn't get brought up very much in all this context. I mean, look, um, every all of these evolutions to how people get into college benefit the rich, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the whole holistic uh, movement, I mean, one, I guess one of the, the few sort of things, sort of bright spots I see in this arena is, there's more and more understanding that like 
rich kids are always going to be better able to to look to look good in a quote unquote holistic context than poor kids, right? Um, the kind of things that flatter the interests of uh, elite colleges, uh, like uh, you know. Uh, who who has a better ability to say, oh yeah, I spent a Peru, I, I spent a, a, my summer in uh, Peru after my sophomore year of high school helping build houses for Habitat for Humanity. You know, who's who's got a better ability to do that, a poor kid or a rich kid, right? Uh, I'm uh, I'm an avid sailor. I've been learning. I've been sailing my whole life, right? Because these these colleges. Um, that are are academically elite but not athletically elite tend to prefer unusual sports sports that are you know not the, the kind that can are easily afforded by public high schools you know fencing things like that who's better Highlight. able to do that yeah Highlight lacrosse fencing yeah yeah um uh <clears throat> although all sports have become more like like it costs i think now a student at a public school uh, if they don't have a a waiver in my state to play even basketball will now cost a grand. Wow. So yeah. it's it's like sports have increasingly, even in the public school context, become an elite thing unless you are super poor, like right. and can get a full waiver. Right. Um <clears throat> meanwhile, you know, one of the things that the SAT did, right, was mm -hmm. It enabled kids who otherwise had no ability to distinguish themselves in those terms and say, hey, look, uh, Ivy League, I am coming from poverty and a, and a deprived background, but I just ripped the SATs in half. Uh, take a look at me. There's many uh, sort of success stories of people who were in that position. Um, it is sure truly. Really, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the t totally bizarre things about this is like, if you say you want a holistic approach to who you choose uh then what are you doing removing information right like if you're dropping the sat well the sat is providing some information if you want to look at people holistically include that information if you want to broaden the number of factors that you look at that's great but don't say you're doing it in, in a holistic sense i mean one of the things that's important to say is like you know sats and grades correlate fairly strongly, but not perfectly. And that's exactly what we want because it means that they are capturing different kinds of academic excellence, right? And, you know, the grades reward the grade grubbers, the grinders, that they reward the people who, uh, you know, follow the directions. The SATs tend to reward the kids who are sort of intrinsically brilliant, but um, who may not have it together to actually get their shit in on time, right? But the, the bigger thing, though, is just that, like, none of that really matters, right? Because um, the majority of American high school students never even applies to a college that uh, rejects more students than they accept, right? The vast majority of American college students go to colleges that are not anything like, like elite or exclusive. Um, it's, I think, less than 30% of American colleges and universities reject more students than they accept. Um, but even that's misleading because those schools tend to have unusually small student bodies. So like as a percentage of the total number of, of like, you know, uh, 18 to 22 year olds, um, the number of people going to these schools is just a tiny sliver of humanity. So you look at affirmative action. I support race-based affirmative action. Uh, uh, for issue, for reasons of reparations for slavery. But if you <clears throat> just think about what's the addressable population there, right? Like we had a month long national conversation on affirmative action. Um, we're talking about the black kids who apply to college. Uh, and a majority of black students don't apply to college uh, after high school. Um, and then we're, we're looking at the kids who apply to elite colleges. We're now we're, we're, we're at a, a small slice of uh, the, you know, black 18 to 20 year old population. Uh, but then we're also talking about the kids who are good enough where they're in the conversation to get into an elite school. Right. So they're not like like uh, where it's not even a. a, a uh, in the realm of possibility, but they're also not the kids who are strong enough where they're going to get in even without an affirmative action slice, the slot. You look at like that slice of humanity and 
I mean, the it, tiny percentage. It's 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 completely back of the envelope, Matt. But I've looked at it before, it like maybe being like fifteen to twenty thousand black kids across the country, right? Right. Where whereas, you know, the untold millions of black kids who don't go to college at all, we know are in much much worse shape, and there's just no conversation about them, right? But this gets back to the very beginning of what we were talking about, right? It's the path dependency of only seeing the meritocratic apparatus as the means through which we create social justice. Uh, well, it, it, yes. I mean, I don't think everybody needs a, a traditional academic education anymore. Um, and I, I don't just mean that in the college sense, also high schools have been moving away from vocational training. And let's be honest as to why, it's expensive. That's why they moved away from it. It wasn't like, yes, we got this big push in the 90s to push everyone into college. That's absolutely true. But a shop program is expensive. Um, And I I really do believe we would be better served um, fixing high schools, putting viable, you know, putting, making them bringing the arts back to poor schools, but also like getting good vocational programs in the, in the poor schools. And then just strengthening our basic math and reading, slowing down the number of standards that we do and teaching the ones that we do well. And uh, for the majority of poor kids of color, we would probably do a lot more for them. Like, but then beyond even that, you and I both know industrial policy is going to do even more than that. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think when, you know, yes, we can make the schools a lot better. And yes, we should be making the primary and secondary schools a lot better, which seems to be totally out of the conversation these days. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it's conceded as somehow a right wing point to talk about like decent public schools for everybody. Um, I guess because it was co-opted by the charter movement in the 90s and uh, and aughts and aught teams. So maybe I get how we got there. But um, it seems to me that, like, I don't know, having jobs for people who don't need degrees would actually probably do even more. And then we can fix the schools, too. Like, Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) and and right now we do have jobs for them. They're just not very good. But it does look like for geopolitical reasons, we're going to be reintegrating a lot of industrial production into the United States over the next 20 years. So who knows, like some of this may happen anyway. Right. Um, and I guess that's, I, for, if anything takes the wind out of my cells, it's that, it's that, that all this seems to be kind of epiphenomenal to larger and frankly, somewhat historically arbitrary factors. I mean, one of the reasons why I think Joe Biden has been progressive from your point of view, and I think fairly, it's having things just come up that have to be addressed for the fucking country to work, even in a capitalist way. And so they've had to, like, start reversing certain policies. It's like, you know, not to sound like a vocal Marxist and not to say subjective conditions don't matter, but some of this is just material reality coming to bear. Right. I, you know, I just think it's remarkable to, to I'm 42 years old, um, to have lived through the beginning of the Reagan of Reaganism. Right. I mean, I was, I was a baby, but, um, uh, and the acceptance of some of the core tenets of neoliberalism by the Democrats, the Clinton, uh, administration being, um, in many ways, the epitome of American, uh, uh, neoliberalism and with even Democrats, um, you know, having a protectionist, uh, uh, industrial policy was just totally, totally contrary to where the Democrats were going. And we, you know, offshoring and globalization was good for everyone and NAFTA was good and uh, the economy just doesn't work that way anymore. And, you know, to where now there's like, you know, talk of a lot of, com- of companies onshoring uh, their jobs again and all this work to sort of create domestic solar production and domestic, you know, chip manufacturing and stuff like that. Um you know, everything old is new again, I guess. Um, it does sort of feel like, you know, in some ways, politically, we're just caught in a cycle that I'm never going to escape. But Yeah, it's, 
it's kind of a bummer. I, I interesting. You and I are almost the exact same age. Um, uh, that probably makes some sense, but it's it's something that I've thought a lot about, particularly in the focus on education. Where on one hand, I think we've entirely over focused on education since the Clinton period, as if it was going to be a magic panacea to turn everybody into lower management for the entire planet. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, that seemed to be the vision, and and we have finally given that up, but. Now it just, there's still the focus on education, but we're not even talking about making like public schools better anymore. It's just like, can we get a few people into better universities at a time, you know, and I think this needs to be noted where fewer and fewer kids are even trying, not just kids of color, kids, period. Right. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when you were talking about uh, the models for for people being rejected, I'm like, well, I think maybe people are thinking about these schools as if it's the late 90s and there was a ton of competition for them. Um, and it's when, you know, the first round of millennials were entering and they were there was like basically a ton of demand. That hasn't been true for like seven, eight years now. Yeah. Um, so and I, I definitely like there's several colleges, even universities here in, in, in Utah that accept everybody. Like they oh, don't I'm, you know. look the, the um <laughs> a huge number of American colleges accept essentially everyone who applies. If if you I mean part of the reason why the affirmative action debate is sort of pointless is that like if if you can cut a tuition check or sign a promissory note and you have a high school diploma, you you can be a college student somewhere. And the kind of kids who we're talking about who are like are not gonna get into Harvard, maybe the black kids who are not gonna get into Harvard. If in fact Harvard honors the intent of the Supreme Court uh, ruling, which they probably won't, but you know, they're, so they're going to go to Brown. They'll be fine. You know what I'm saying? Like they'll, they'll they'll go to Dartmouth or to Williams, right? Like I, they're they're not the people that we should be worried about. Yeah. Um, are there any big takeaways you'd like to end off of, and then I'll let you plug. Obviously, we plugged the book, but right. I you know here's here's what I'll say. I um. So what I, I researched this at the beginning of the book writing process, knowing that I would not include it in the book because I don't want to like put anyone on blast for things that they said and did when they were 19, 20, 21 years old. But, um, you know, in, there was a, a sort of a thing that sort of presaged uh, the, um, the, the 2010s and, and this moment, you know, and, and social justice movement and the sort of woke moment was, you know, happening on college campuses in like the early to mid 2010s, where there was a series of, you know, people called it the campus uprising. And there was a series of, you know, protests and controversies and issues at colleges like Oberlin and Amherst uh, and Wesleyan and <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Um, Yale had a big one uh, where uh, it, like an administrator was sort of uh, in a in a confrontation with a student activist on camera, which sort of which blew up and went viral, you know. Um, anyway, these college students who sort of were engaged in that stuff have names, and uh, those names were in the public record uh, in various forms in various places. Usually, I found them in campus newspapers, um, and so I just went to sort of look and sort of follow up on these kids' lives and what they were doing. And um, I don't think any of them became like Republicans, right? I don't think any of them like like sort of sort of completely renounced their political ideals. But just about all of them had just sort of been absorbed into the machinery of American upper middle class life, right? Like they 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 went out and they became lawyers. You know, I saw one of them was like an environmental lawyer. I guess that's cool. You know, a bunch of them sort of got jobs at, at nonprofits where they can sort of you know talk about changing the world, et cetera, et cetera. But by and large, they did what kids at elite colleges do, right? Which is like they go out and they just become part of the upper middle class, the ruling class of American society. And these were the, the kids who do just, you know, a few years before or earlier, I guess maybe 10 years earlier now at this point, but who, who in, in a past life had been demanding, you know, revolutionary change on campus. Um, and the whole point of the book for me is to sort of, honor the sort of spirit with which they were once fighting while also acknowledging 
this is what our system does, right? It absorbs revolutionary fervor into the comforts of American middle class and above life. And that's cyclical and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. All right. Uh, and where can people find your work, Freddie? Uh, you can find me at freddydebore.substack.com. More importantly, How Elites Ate the Social Justice Movement is uh, <clears throat> in bookstores now. Uh, and there are some like non-Amazon, non-Barnes and Noble options out there if you want to buy it. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, or it's, you can go to the physical store uh, and you should check it out. Yeah, I agree. I have it. Thank you so much. And talk to you soon.